Amanda, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. I, I got a little bit of your story, <laughs> and uh, uh, a friend of mine connected me with you. And, and the grasp that I got from your social media, um, which is just a, a glimpse, obviously, into your life, is that uh, you're super inspiring, and you're doing a lot to help people understand um, adversity and how to overcome it. And also um, people, especially who are afflicted with cancers, how it doesn't have to be the end of their life. They could move on and they could evolve as a person. Um, let's back up because there is an origin story with you and where you came from. You're actually a veteran, which is really cool. Thank you for your service. Thank you for yours. Um, man, I feel old talking <laughs> about your recent experiences in the military. My Sergeant Major experiences are very old. Um, but you went into the military and you went in to the military post your college experience. What, what did you go to school for? Uh, so I went to the University of Washington for society, ethics, and human behavior. So it was double um, with a human rights minor, actually. Really? Yeah, very strange. That's very philanthropic. What What was the desire to do something like that in the in the, your academic experience? Yes, actually, I grew up with an Asian dad, so I'm Japanese. Um, oh, really? Yes, half Japanese. What? And you're half too, right? So I'm I'm quarter. I'm thirteen percent according to my <laughs> DNA. Thirteen percent Japanese. Uh, you're Japanese. Yeah, I didn't have, know. Have, yeah, those invasions you guys did this. <laughs> um, uh, up to fifty percent, whatever that that math is. Thirty. See, I'm half Asian. Thirty three percent Korean, and okay. then the rest Norwegian. Oh, okay. Got yeah. It. So you're half Japanese. Half Japanese. Really? Yes, I know. <laughs> I didn't know you were Japanese. I knew you were yeah, Korean. I didn't. A know little you were bit. Japanese. I got a uh, Yoshi Mi Miyagi. Yoshi. Yeah, I yeah, met him. Miyagi, Mr. Miyagi over there. Oh, um, yeah. He's he's full Japanese. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, yes. so backing it up a little bit before academics. Yeah. You're half Japanese. We're, you were raised in Washington? Washington, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so, then, yeah, where'd that experience come from with the Japanese? Yeah, so my family immigrated right before the internment camps were instilled in Washington wow. State. I actually have an Aunt Ida. Um, she was born in Idaho internment camp. Wow. Um, so we were, um, we, our family went through that whole experience. So we were very whitewashed. Um, yeah. My dad actually doesn't speak Japanese, but he's full Japanese. He looks, I mean, you would, you would maybe guess that he doesn't speak English, like really? looking at him, yeah. yeah. But he's like the most white guy ever. He's the only Japanese man I've ever known who's listened to country music and- <laughs> Drives a pickup truck probably. <laughs> uh, no, he was an old 94 uh, Toyota Camry, but yeah, um, yeah and, and loves fried chicken, doesn't really eat Japanese food. And I think a lot of it has to do with just growing up in that experience. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, growing up Japanese in, in itself is an interesting, um, be, way of being raised in being able to serve, or I guess the uh, expectations of of being super excellent, but then also to serve other people. And yeah. I think that uh, definitely has even come in, into my life at this point in my life, post-cancer, post-military and everything. Yeah, it's a very subservient culture and it's very selfless, I find that I, I, I really respect um, Asian culture, being Asian, mm -hmm. but, but when you're raised that way, you know, like my mom was a, a tiger mom, you know, she was mm -hmm. very aggressive <laughs> and very, uh, very much the disciplinary where my dad was more, or he was, he was more liberal. He was just like, mm -hmm. kind of do what you want. And my dad and my mom was the, like, I'll beat mm -hmm. you with a stick and you have to study and do all the things. Mm -hmm. But it, it strikes a really good balance, especially in service. Mm -hmm. And you decided to do something academically and in, in that has to do with human rights. Where did that side of you come from? Did it come from your experience growing up? I think a large portion came from my experience growing up. You know, we grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, and uh, I think I my experience was so different than my dad's. So I was very interested in, in knowing how people operated. One of my favorite classes actually in high school was was American government because I just thought it was very interesting the way that Americans interact with each other on a daily basis, but then also how we decide what rules are put into place. And mm. that was just really fascinating to me. And in in my college experience, I wanted to learn more about people in general and maybe what we qualify as a human right and what we don't qualify as a human right. And the more nitty gritty when it comes, when it comes to those, I guess, overarching larger words mm. and how maybe they've been misconstrued over time. Mm -hmm. um, because and truthfully, like a, a, a human right is shelter and water. Mm. It's not what maybe some perceive it to be now. Mm, interesting. Interesting. What was the uh, expectation for you going through that academic experience? Did you have a profession in mind? 
So actually, I, I was pre-law before oh, um, before I had uh, about junior year is when I switched, and my dad actually talked me out of it. There was large expectations that I would go into the tech field, um, mm, of as, <laughs> yeah, as Asian as parents per. have. <laughs> um, it was it was actually uh, even in junior year, he my dad had tricked me into going to a job fair for IT. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? You're like going out to eat or something? He and says, oh, my company is going to be at this job fair. You should come to it. It's going to be so good for you and your major. And I was like, "I, why is your company there? Because he worked for a software company. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not... I'm not going, you know, I'm not computer science. He's like, oh no, there's gonna be tons there. Every person I talked to was like, oh, okay, so where, like what computer science degree are you majoring in? And I was like, I am not oh. majoring in computer science. But this is just uh, definitely a Japanese experience of you know, having a path that you're supposed to follow as a good Asian daughter or son and be able to follow that correctly. And uh, yes, I think there's a really great uh, transference to the military um, because of that, because I grew up, that was normal for me. So then joining the military was not a shell shock for me. It yeah. was almost normal. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. My experience, when I joined the army at 17, I thought the army was easy. Oh, you were 17. Yeah, I was 17, oh, wow. I was a baby. And yeah. when I joined, I was like, Oh, this is easy mm -hmm. compared to my home life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is not discipline. This is this is real easy. Where did the where was the seed of maybe I want to join the military and do something in, mm -hmm. in service? Was that because yeah. usually it's tied to a lineage in, in the mm -hmm. experience in your family, but you decided, hey, this is something I want to do. Where did that come from? Uh, just the desire to serve and be part of something larger than myself. That mm. was a huge, a huge motivator for me to join. Uh, I think we all grow up with so many blessings in our lives. And I always felt like I owed something to my country for the opportunity to live in an experience where I get the basic needs um, mm. that I'm provided every day. And I grew up very much knowing that, you know, not everyone has clean water. Not everyone is able to have cars or plug their phone into the wall and so many great things that we are awarded just being here and uh, i did, did definitely feel like the japanese uh cultural desire to serve um, my country and, and have honor with that um but yeah i didn't join until after i i had i actually didn't 100 percent decide that i wanted to join the military until i had already graduated but i left like two months after i graduated really for the army and i had originally went uh my whole path was my whole, I guess, goal was to go the Air Force route and OCS route for the Air mm. Force. I love airplanes. Uh, my grandpa worked for Boeing for 45 years. So I've always like been really fascinated by airplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that didn't work out. I think the Air Force didn't need uh, officers at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just like, oh, just go in the Army. Yes. Very different experience Very in different. the Army. Very different. Um, if I can give my daughter advice, it would be join the Air Force, mm -hmm. never join the Army. <laughs> but so you, was there a defining, was there a specific moment that you remember where you're like, I, I got to do something here and I'm going to do it? Was it, what was it tied to? That's a great question. I don't think there's one defining answer to that. Mm. I think it's more so of just, I want to to give back or to be part of something larger than myself. Mm. And I was I was a personal trainer. I worked three jobs while going to school. Um, of course you did. At the university. You should have been working five. <laughs> I should have <laughs> <laughs> been pulling four all-nighters <laughs> instead of three all-nighters a week. <laughs> Um, and I think that was that honestly could, could have been part of it as well, of just feeling like I was doing so many different things that I wanted to just focus on one thing. Um, and I love athletics. I've always been an athlete. I played boys baseball growing up from three to 18. Really? Yes. That's awesome. Yes. How did you fare in that? Did you do really well? I did really well. Yeah. Um, what I, position do you play in baseball? I was a pitcher oh, and wow. then middle infield. <laughs> That's yes. awesome. Um, I love, and I think baseball is like the perfect Japanese sport because it's all about repetitions mm -hmm. and being able to improve with each repetition mm -hmm. instead of it just being like, you're naturally gifted at whatever, whatever this sport is yeah. and, or you're seven, five. So like, you're just naturally going to be better at basketball. It doesn't work like that with baseball. Yeah. Um, so I love, and I love like the little technical aspects of pitching of, you know, one finger, tiny millimeter on, on the ball is going to make a difference. Mm. And yeah, I loved playing baseball and I was the only girl in Washington State playing on these boys teams. And I think nowadays with social media, maybe it would be a, a different experience. But like back then it was like, who, what the heck is going on here? Like this, we never seen this tiny little Asian girl. <laughs> um, it's just these like huge dudes up until, you know, I mean, never because I'm 5'2". So, um, but yeah, it was such a great experience. I love playing baseball and I think that also helped 
me in the military as well. Just growing up in very male dominated spaces and and being accustomed to having to prove people that I'm not, I guess, uh, that my worth isn't just about what I look like or me being a small lady and that I'm capable of so much more. Yeah, that's super interesting. The highest paid baseball player in the world now is Japanese, now American uh, yes. baseball player, which is, it's just awesome. Yes. Um, you you go in the military and then how did you, because you went from potentially joining the Air Force through OCS mm -hmm. or becoming an officer, and then you decide, did you enlist? Mm -hmm. You enlisted in the army <laughs> as an intel specialist. Mm -hmm. Why enlistment versus actually becoming an officer? Um, your classic recruiter. Um, oh, no. I know <laughs> those guys. This really um, was unfortunate just because I didn't have family growing up um, that maybe would have been like, hey, make sure to verify that information before yeah. you go. Um, but I was told that it's, you go in, go in enlisted and then you can just go to officer school anytime, anytime you want. You want. <laughs> yeah, just raise your hand and they'll be like, hey, we've been waiting for you to raise your hand. Yeah, we've been waiting all this time for you to, to pay you more and to give you better quality <laughs> of experience here. But yeah, so I went in, honestly, I think everything happens for a reason, truthfully. And I loved my experience. I wouldn't take it back for anything, even respect or a higher pay grade or anything like that um, because I really loved my job. I had a really great experience in the military and very unique experience. And um, yeah, I definitely, I should have been, I, if I could go back, I would maybe give her a little bit more advice, like ask someone else if this is true mm. um, before you're just signing your life away for for so long. Um, yeah, you, you did, is the golf, because 35 series is Intel. And then what is the golf specialty? Uh, geospatial intelligence. Oh, nice. Yeah. Geospatial, like NRO stuff, NSA stuff. Um, so your focus was that, and then you, you get through training. And then how do you get tied into special operations? Because very specifically, you served at J, uh, JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command, and also First Group, which is fitting that they would align an Asian with first group because the, the AOR, their area of responsibility is first group. Mm -hmm. Unlike me, where they put me in third group, mm -hmm. where I went to French language school. Oh so I'm a, uh, a Japanese, Korean, American <laughs> speaking. speaking French in Iraq, operating in Iraq, which didn't make sense. I love it. But how did you get lined out for that? Was it a recruitment process where you knew you were going or did they pick you up in, in the training? It's almost like one of those things that you read about or like you're told about exists. But I was like plucked out of class one day at AIT and it was someone I'd never seen before. It was mm -hmm. very strange. And maybe you know more about this mm -hmm. coming from back, your background, but um, yeah, someone literally took me out of class and said, hey, like we're gonna put you into this program gave me basically no information on it. Are you interested? In which I said, sure. <laughs> and um, I didn't know this at the time, but that was, it's. It, I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it was called Quick Start. Mm -hmm. And they took high performing um, individuals in school and athletics or mm -hmm. in and PT um, out of school and put them towards this, this Quick Start program. So these, I, I served with I think we're, there's only approximately 15 of us at the time, Mike's, Golfs, and Foxes, um, who were part of this Quick Start program. So mm. uh, took soldiers from AIT, trained them up, attached them to special forces groups, and yeah, just very unique experience. And I think it was due to the fact that I had, you know, maxed out the male scale on the PT on my PT, did very well in school, but then also had like the social aspects that I think some soldiers may also not have in the kindest way. <laughs> a lot of them don't have that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I was the first golf within a year that had been chosen for this program. Definitely the first golf, female golf in five, maybe plus years um, who had been selected for this program. And and yeah, very strange. Like something you literally see in the movie is of like someone coming and plucking you out of class um, and then telling you not to really tell anyone about it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Things can get weird like that. I was like, okay, I guess so. <laughs> hey guys, if you know Phil Craft Survival, if you know Mike Force, if you know me, then you likely know about Montana Knife Company. Montana Knife Company was founded by a buddy of mine, Josh Smith, master bladesmith for 30 years. One of the most experienced knife makers in the country, and he's had no compromise and all the integrity because he's making all of his knives. He's made that decision early on, by the way, to make all of his knives made in the USA, manufactured locally in his home state of Montana. Designed, tested, and built by hunters, 
Montana Knife Company is a hunting knife company first and foremost. Likely the sharpest knives in the market. I mean, you likely need a bleeding control kit if you're going to own a Montana knife, and that's a good problem to have. They sell out instantaneously. But for the first time in the history of his company, because he's gotten ahead, he has stock of your favorite knives, including the Blackfoot 2.0, the Spigo, or the Stonewall Skinner. And you could save 10% by using MF10. That's Mike Foxtrot 10, MF10, for 10% off your first order at MontanaKnifeCompany.com. Yeah, it's um, so <laughs> proactively, uh, Special, Special Forces Command and Special Operations Command as a whole started hand selecting certain roles, especially tied to intelligence, because for a period of time, specifically my time, we are rec receiving support personnel to Special Forces groups or even to JSOC that potentially were just because of their name, their social, and then their orders mm -hmm. were designated towards us. They get there and then they weren't the right fit. They weren't the right match. Or they didn't have the aptitude to do anything more advanced, like potentially attach themselves to a team who was speaking a foreign language in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. And so proactively, the command started handpicking people down based on aptitude, likely your technical scores, your your general scores, and also your obviously physical fitness scores, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense. Like I, totally. why you wouldn't do that from the onset yeah. I mean, and why we would go through, I think in my time period, it, it was, that was the reasons we had what's called HSC first sergeant positions, mm -hmm. which were 18 series master sergeant positions to manage those support p personnel and then weed them through a selection process and then kick them back to the big army potentially. And I'm like, why would you do that when you could hand select them in training, mm -hmm. like groom them through a process where totally. they're they're built up and have a foundation and then they report to the unit squared away. Totally. I, I don't know why you wouldn't do that, but that's cool yeah. that you got plucked that uh, way. Yeah, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, it definitely removed me from big army right away though. Um, yeah. So I definitely, even at first group, like small things like standing in formation, I wasn't used to like being in, in uniform. I wasn't in uniform, most yeah. of my services and civvies. So it was kind of a interesting experience and definitely a unique experience, but you're so right. It makes a lot of sense. You want to make sure that who you're picking mm -hmm. um, can stand up to the challenge and not, you know, fall to, to pressure or whatever it might, might end up being. Um, yeah, how was your experience working with uh, the monster? Like immediately when you say JSOC, people think special missions units, and certainly there is that, but um, technically special missions units are subordinate com commands, they're action arms for JSOC Maine. Mm -hmm. JSOC Maine, for people who are listening to this, is a beast. Mm -hmm. It is a, Everything that you you get in the find fix components and intel and operations and support mechanisms, interagency relationships is done by JSOC Maine so the operator can breach the door and kill the bad guy. That is a monster. You were part of that apparatus. What was that experience like? Oh man, that's a great question. I think for me it was it was all that I knew at the time. Um, but it really did I guess put into my head very very early on that my actions had direct impact on people's lives. So it was high pressure and it was constant, right? You know, you're on you're on a deployment schedule without being deployed, mm -hmm. um, but you also have access to the highest quality equipment, the highest like standards for for it, with the work that you're putting out because it, it does make an impact and everything that you everything that you do, it's very it's very clear to you that everything that you do has a extreme amount of care behind it and has to be extremely accurate. Mm. And being a student, coming from a student perspective, we were kind of groomed, like you said, um, to be able to know going into that, that that's the experience that we were going to have. But you don't really know until you know, until mm. you get there and you see people's lives who are impacted by it. Um, and and yeah, it, it, it is a giant machine. Um, and if you are not part of the gears that are constantly running in an effective way, it is very clear. So mm. it is just, it is one of those things that's, uh, I think being hand selected is really important. And I, there, we worked with a lot of civilians as well, Navy, Air Force on the floor as well. Um, and just learning how to collaborate with people who come from all different walks of life and be super effective and super communicate really uh, clearly and effectively and accurately. And 
I, I loved my experience there. It was it was just high stress, but it definitely it made the rest of my military experience, even at first group, feel insignificant. Yeah. Um, it's like severely insi- insignificant. Yeah, it's it's very different because uh, JSOC is a C two command where other organizations, even first group, the five groups, and then the reserve components, they do most of their C twoing, their command and control forward operating. Mm-hmm. JSOC Maine does it CONUS. Mm-hmm. And and so you're in a potential work cycle where you're you're operating on the tactical operations center floor in a cycle and you're going to war. There is no time to have formations mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and do the garrison. There is no garrison. Mm-hmm. Um you're on leave and you're on break or you're working and you're and you're doing operations. Mm-hmm. And you know, JSOC's the best organization for that. Mm-hmm. They're the uh, Fortune 500 of companies that in global pursuit get it get it done. Mm-hmm. You you go from that experience at Joint Special Operations Command. I, I imagine learning a lot and having a, a lot of experiences, and then you go to first group. Was that a was that kind of a culture shock for you? Totally, a hu- like huge, massive culture shock for mm-hmm. me. For one, I went. I was attached to Myco, um, and I was by far the subject matter expert in in my my group. And mm-hmm. what's that? Is it Akron? Is it a, a Myco oh, Military Intelligence Command? Okay. Um, so when I was attached to to my platoon um, within the group, it was very clear that kind of the experience that I was walking into was so different. And at JSOC as well, of course, rank matters, of course, respect matters, but everyone is fully aware that your job, your individual job is incredibly important. It's more important than rank, which is why, in my opinion, that's why being in civvies kind of leveled the playing field. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, no hat, no salute, um, definitely played a key role. Um, and first, group is also no hat, no salute, but you can mm-hmm. still feel, it's just a different feel. And I think being in an environment where I wasn't always on was very difficult for me. Also coming from my background of having three jobs while going to college, being Japanese, I felt like if I wasn't doing something all of the time, I felt like I was like, what am I even doing here? Like mm. kind of driving myself a little bit crazy. Um, and also not being able to see the fruits of my labor. With JSOC, it was every single day, multiple times a day, I was seeing the fruits of my labor. And that's really rewarding for me, Um, as it is for everyone. Having instant gratification is really rewarding for lots of people. Um, But being in an experience where I didn't feel like I had as much impact, Mm. it really woke me up to to some things that I was so blessed to be able to have, right? And, and, And coming out of school and having that feeling of having an impact and then kind of feeling like I was going backwards Mm. was really, really tough for me. Yeah. and yeah, and then struggling also with being recognized as a subject matter expert, but not having any sort of respect coming into it as well because of my rank, because X, Y, Z. Um, I didn't actually even go to uh, ALS or yeah. uh, ALC. ALC, um, was it E5 school or sergeant school? Uh, uh, or that's school. E6 school, that's right. I Yeah, I was retired at E5 yeah. because I didn't want to. I, I wanted to get better at my job. I kept taking ITC training, kept training, taking additional trainings to be really great at my job without wanting to accelerate my career, um, which is a personal choice of full, I'm fully aware. But I think that was also the environment that JSOC bred was I wanted to be stellar at my job. I really didn't care what other people thought of me, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but Big Army does care about that. And even group cares about that. Yeah, I hate that. It's, it's, it's weird because the tethering to JSOC um, you you would think that you would almost operate as a civil servant, like you would be a GS something, mm-hmm. right? And then taking off the uniform, and then everybody being on an equal playing field, and and not having a chain of command and custody that made it awkward. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just debilitates your ability to get the job done mm-hmm. because you're so worried about this hierarchy mm-hmm. that doesn't really apply to the specific skill sets that get the job done. Mm-hmm. And it's just, oh, it's so taxing. I it hate that taxing. for you. But so okay. you, you, you go to first group yep. and then this comes, you're in the military when you're actually diagnosed with yes. cancer. Yes. Walk, walk me through this whole process. And, and if it's, uh, if there's anything you need to stop on or, or pause on, just let me know. Yeah. But I mean, no, I, this has got to be a traumatic experience for you, like getting diagnosed. How does it come about? And and then how did it, walk me through the process of how this happens? Yeah. So I actually had my, uh, my cancer started on my foot. 
Um, so I had a tumor on my foot mm -hmm. and every cancer starts with some sort of finding of a tumor is generally how they're found. Um, I had a tumor on my foot that I guess at some point may have signified a mole. Um, but by the time I had looked at it, it, it was really didn't signify a mole. Um, it was, it, it looked very weird. <laughs> and I had seen this, this tumor grow significantly over a period of time, um, but I didn't want to get it looked at. I never saw the doctor in the military um, unless I had to or was mm -hmm. getting vaccines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe some can relate to this, but I never wanted to be sick. So I never wanted to address or I guess tell myself that I was sick enough to go to the doctor. Um, but uh, I had, I was initially, uh, eventually forced by my husband to go get it looked at by mm. a military doctor. And I was shooed out of his office. And this was approximately a year after I'd, I had noticed it and it had started to have like internal feelings. Like it almost felt like it had a life of its own is how I described it. Or it was like, it felt like it was wanting to itch out of its skin. Um, very weird definitely did not no longer felt or looked like a mole um so he finally forced me to go i went and then the doctor said it's nothing get out of my office and was, I was this like, a, a group pa or a doc it in was the big army clinic doc in the big army clinic and in civ civ doctor yep. um and I have empathy for him because I'm sure he sees things all the time that are more significant. Uh, but I think it's also important to note that I had already not wanted to go. And then I don't think he recognized who I was standing in his office of like, if I'm coming to you, it's probably important, not vice versa. Not I'm coming to you because this is my 40th visit for something that I don't have. Um, yeah, so I, I had it looked at, shoot out of my, his office and I, I said, awesome. I got the answer that I wanted. And now I'm good to go to continue on. And, and my military career was incredibly important to me. It was the most, by far the most important to me. And I, it was my whole identity. And so I was like, oh, great, I got this answer that I wanted. And it took me another year to get it re-looked at after Tyler begged me again, please go get it looked at. And I actually- So it gets worse over the course of this year, obviously. Yes, yeah. And actually I went to his dermatologist to help him. He is Irish, so he has tons of moles. So he gets moles removed all the time. Mm -hmm. um, this is also important. Skin cancer, melanoma and skin cancer are separate things, but also intertwined. But melanoma at its lowest stages or even just regular in not normal skin cells happen all the time. Mm. And melanoma is incredibly preventable if you catch it really early on. And uh, most people, like 99% of people who have melanoma are caught in this stage one because they notice something, they get it checked out and they get it removed. And that's just like a mole that looks raised in appearance? Or? There's a bunch of characteristics, but um, it could, it's color. A lot of it is identified by color. So super dark moles or moles that have changed color over time, mm. have um, abnormal borders um, that have grown large portions over small periods of time. But yeah, he, he, he has had moles removed for my whole experience with him. So he, I went with him to the doctor to get his moles removed um, because they actually do go with, within a certain border of, of that abnormal cell. If they find abnormal cells. Mm -hmm. And he said, before we left, um, I need you to look at her foot. And wow. <laughs> yeah. And did he know immediately when looking at it? So it was a female, female doc, but she said, Amanda, you like very seriously, seriously. She looked at my foot and said, you need to go get this looked at a hundred percent. So and did, the, did the military doctor even look at your foot? He looked at my foot, but he literally was like one second sock off, <laughs> one second yeah. sock on. You'd go back to work. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. so you get, uh, you, you get looked at, I imagine a biopsy or something like that takes yes. place and then they detect it for cancer. And then how, what result do you get back? Yeah, it was very strange, actually. So I had um, a first initial biopsy where they, they just take a little bit of, of the, the mole in order to get cells. I didn't hear back for three months. It took the military three months to get back to me. Okay, so you go to back to a military doctor. Oh, yes. Sorry, yes, I skipped that. Yep. Yeah. So after dermatologist, I went to back to a military doctor, demanded a referral to a dermatologist at that point because I was like, okay, well, now I'm sure that there's something wrong. So I got referral to dermatologist within the military and he was like oh, amanda another you know what the heck why didn't you get this looked at and did you tell him you looked you had it looked at it a year prior he said no one should have let you out of your office with this interesting yeah so 
Yeah, and and so he initially biopsied it, and then it took three months. He kept he kept calling and said like, just want to let you know like, and it was for the first month he kept calling, and we haven't heard anything yet. I don't know how true that is. I haven't heard anything yet. And then I hadn't heard from him for two months. And I, in my eyes, I was like, no news, good news, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what we're course. told all the time. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up with a call a voicemail that was left on my phone. And it was, hey, uh, Amanda, you need to come in. I just need you to, to know that this is serious. And I need, I need you to schedule an appointment as soon as possible. Because they can't tell you it over the phone. Can't leave a voicemail mail with a diagnosis was put into his office. This is what we think it is. Um, we're going to need to get you into surgery within the next month. So, and then I had a major foot and ankle and groin surgery to remove uh, the tumor, um, skin, ligaments, fat, and then lymph nodes. Yeah. Wow. And they made you wait for a period of time, like from the, the period of diagnosis and telling you, then there was a wait to get into surgery? Oh yeah, it was like 30 day wait to get into surgery. Because of scheduling? Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the military. One yeah. of my snipers, Rich Stay School, uh, when I was his team sergeant, um, he was a uh, army sniper, mm. or I'm sorry, a Marine Corps sniper. And he was shot in combat, saved by an 18 Delta Special Forces guy, became a sniper on my team mm-hmm. as a Green Beret. Mm-hmm and was very accomplished and same thing he went to the doctor and they did a chest x-ray and they said yeah you're good and he had stage four cancer um and they could have early detected it a year in advance but they just told me yeah whatever like get back to work um and and the 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 scan it would be apparent to every single radiologist who saw that 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 was very much indicative of cancer but they just obviously didn't pay attention because not to say there's not good army docs. I know a lot of them, especially on the special operations side, Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of, um, it's not exactly the tip of the spear when it comes to uh, a lot of the the medical professionals there. So you get, you get this intrusive, I imagine, and traumatic surgery. Mm -hmm. What is the diagnosis post this experience? This is stage, you said stage two? So at this point, it would have been stage two, yes. And, and what is what does that mean for people who, who don't understand? It's all foggy, and it depends on the cancer that you have. Um, but specifically to melanoma, um, stage one is, is basically just what your eye can see. Um, that's how far the cancer is, has traveled. And then um, once it's gone outside of a certain number uh, from the original cancer site, then it becomes stage two. So if it's spread over a certain like I guess sphere space of, of your skin, then it's considered stage two, and there's a huge jump from stage two to stage three. Yeah, because once it becomes stage three, then it's a silent killer. Um, yeah. Tyler's my husband's grandpa actually died from melanoma, and it's oh, wow. because of this because it's so sneaky. It's one of those things that's uh, your lymphatic system is what regulates your entire body, um, and you know shovels it basically has c- complete control over your immune system, etc. Um, so so many people. I guess are not necessarily aware of the difference between stage two, stage three, stage one, stage four. Um, but once it's it's metastatic or once it's traveling in your in your body, then it becomes stage three, and then stage four is when it's traveled uh, to an additional organ. Mm. Um, so from skin to lung to brain, and that melanoma goes. It's very often that you'll find it in the in the brain and in the lung in later later stages of of care. And so mine was stage, it was an accelerated stage B, um, which they have gradings within stage three. And yes, I had a doctor, the the general surgeon, at, uh, maybe I just won't say, um, general surgeon who gave me my surgery, sat me down and said, this is going to lead to your demise. He said that out loud? He said that. And my husband and I looked at each other we're like, what, dude? And this is a military doc? Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> This um, is going to lead to your demise. What does that even mean? <laughs> I mean, it's just I a would cryptic. slap that dude in the face. What does that even mean? Yeah. And, and then, so when they, when you said you had surgeries from your foot to your groin, mm-hmm. I imagine they're literally taking out everything that potentially has cancer in it. Mm-hmm. So it spread that far. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. That's got to be scary. And so you actually have lymph nodes behind your knee as well. And they didn't take any from that site because they found them farther. So they took the, the farther lymph nodes. It's very strange also. Lymphatic cancer is treated with surgery, but it's antiquated to take all lymph nodes. But to the a patient who has cancer, you would hope that they would just take all, like just take all of the lymph nodes that may be affected. But they then treat with chemo. So any sort of internal cancer, they treat with intravenous drugs. Um, and most of them are trial drugs. So that was uh, the next step following surgery. But yeah, this surgery was, it was in insane. I was non-weight bearing for, for six months, which uh, completely derailed all the plans that I had for the military and put me into a perspective that I wasn't sure I would ever fall into of being like the injured soldier. Yeah. Um, which has, it's, it's sad to think that that has a stigma against it, but it for sure does, especially being a small lady. I already have all like the visual cards against me. So mm. then adding a boot on there, adding crutches on there, just, it made me feel like I was placed in an experience where I was made to feel extremely weak. Yeah. It's like, it's similar to like being a member of a, um, uh, athletic team where mm -hmm. everybody's performance is measured by their physical ability mm -hmm. and you show up in a cast mm -hmm. well you're immediately that person or that guy totally and it's unfortunate because there's not a very good system for taking care of people especially who are dealing with mental or physical injuries mm -hmm. and then you you just feel like crap the entire time mm -hmm. and then you go to formation limping your ass into formation it's like what is going on why would they not have this figured out mm -hmm. so you you're in the military this entire time dealing with this whole process just in this segment that we've discussed so far how has your over, <laughs> overall experience been with the medical system and what were some of uh, uh, the deficiencies that you saw and what are things that could potentially be done better that's a great question i think in general, the system is flawed, but I think in general, the medical system in the world or specifically in our country is also very flawed. And I think, unfortunately, because there's just been a, a antiquated system within the military of hiring doctors and keeping doctors around, I think that that festers these doctors that are not necessarily not not that they're not qualified, but maybe not being held accountable for their actions as heavily as they would be in the, in the world, I guess, in the civilian world. Mm. Um, because in the civilian world, you have to get your clients. You have to maintain your clients. Your pay is determined on how good of a job you do mm -hmm. versus military doctors. You're going to have clients no matter what because you have no choice but to go to this doctor. Mm. And I think that's kind of, th that is the difference that I've seen, um, seeing military doctors and seeing civilian doctors, um, though th I think in general, the system is flawed. Um, I think anytime you're making money off of providing care to people, you get some bad eggs for sure. Um, from my experience, I would say the most important thing that I would change if I had this experience is to be able to, to, to provide people who have chronic illnesses a a better pathway instead of just allowing them to just exist in the same space that they were when they got sick and and then getting out right it's a it's either you're in or you're out there's no there's there's no middle ground there's no help and i i felt an extreme i guess lack of love back from the army when i had gotten to the point of going through chemo and all the love that I felt like I gave and all the effort that I gave, and I always tried to do my, the best that I possibly could. And and I didn't, I graduated college and I didn't take a different job. I didn't just try and make money. I wanted to serve. And I felt like I gave my all and I got zero back when I got sick. And that was really hard. That was hard for me to, a hard pill for me to swallow. And I've talked about this with some of my friends who are still at JSOC. I think it would have been a different experience if I was there. Yeah, but 100%. I wasn't. Yeah, Jay Sock would have took care of you. I've seen how they they do take care of guys and and gals that are afflicted with injury or disease or cancer, and it's so disheartening to hear this out loud because this the sergeant major in me just is disgusted with that because it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking 2020, and when I went in the army all the way through my last deployment with the agency and also the military. I didn't see any change. And and obviously it hasn't changed today. Yeah. Um we, you get this diagnosis, you get this surgery and then you get chemotherapy. How long did the chemotherapy last? So for my first cancer, I went through 14 months of chemo. 
And what does that involve? Like for somebody who's yeah. not understanding what chemotherapy, I, I think chemotherapy is like they put you in an MRI machine and it kind of oh. radiates this thing <laughs> over you. Like what is what is chemotherapy? Yeah. Um, so chemo is uh, inject usually injected into your bloodstream. Mm. So I actually have a scar, it's a port scar. So originally I- That's where the chemo goes in? Mm-hmm. So there's a something called a port. So the port is attached to a catheter that's actually directed through your veins into your heart. So it bypasses your veins in your arms or your legs to be, I guess, better administered for longer periods of time. So my blood draws were all done through my chest. My chemo was all administered through my chest. Um, just long-term chemo effects on veins is, is horrible. Um, so it was all administered through here. And I, I had the chemo that I was on trial chemo, um, which is, which means it's experimental, <laughs> right? Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we can talk more about that when we talk about my secondary cancer, because that was a whole experience. But, um, yeah, so I went through 14, 14 months, every three weeks I was going back for an, an another chemotherapy session. And with these, it was this, non-stop roller coaster of I feel like crap for two and a half weeks I feel okay for three days and then I go in for another chemo mm. and it was this constant revolving door if you've ever known anyone who's gone through chemotherapy it's I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy it is I mean I still have effects today from my chemo and when it comes to fertility when it comes to um, brain health body health my immune system it's damaged me forever and I I don't think that that's um I guess we're not educated on that as much as on pa as patients. We're given a booklet of uh, 155 pages of side effects, but it's you take this or you die. Yeah, there's no alternative. There's no alternative. So we went, my husband and I, he was at every single chemo session, which I am ever grateful for. Um, but keep in mind, we're also going through all this during COVID in Washington state. Wow. Are you doing chemotherapy on base or is it outside of base no, outsourced? It's outsourced. Okay. So I, I was at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, which mm -hmm. is world renowned for their cancer treatment. Okay. So you're getting good care, at least at the chemo place. Yes. Kinda. Yeah. What would you rank it from zero to hundred <laughs> percent? Well, I'm going to say something that's probably going to anger some, but, um, I would say from my experience, a 30%, um, I think in general, there's great care, but my care team did not tell me about impacts of chemo on fertility until I'd already started treatment. Really? And they say, when they actually have a fertility clinic at Seattle Cancer Care, and they usually refer clients to the fertility to freeze their eggs before they go through chemo, because chemo can forever impact your fertility, especially as a woman. And we had brought it up to them after I'd already started chemotherapy, and they said, oops, sorry. Are bad. We don't see people that are your age very often. <laughs> so what does that mean? Does that mean you're you're not able to have children potentially? So, potentially. Do you would you know yeah. will you know about that? And is I mean, is that something that obviously takes time and then you could identify if that's gonna be a Yeah. Oh man. Um so you, this is severely traumatic. And you're dealing with, is there pain associated with, uh, associated with it as well as nausea? I hear nausea is a big yeah. thing. Nausea, I mean, like extreme, I had um, like extreme inflammation all over my body. So it's just all the time I was so, I felt so achy and icky and I'm still recovering from surgery. Um, and for me, like it was the brain, like I, I lost so much of my clarity of my succinct thinking of my memory and the brain impacts on me were the hardest because I'm like, I can deal with anything physically, but you make me feel like not myself, then that's like a whole different experience. Um, but yeah, for the first week, essentially you're bedridden because you're throwing up every five seconds, you're fainting, you're unfortunately going to go do UAs that are instilled by your command the day after chemo. Um, and yeah, it just, it is, it's horrible. I just wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. And this is where I say the love, the not loving back or not feeling like I'm a team member anymore kind of played in. You think that was a breakdown of very specific leadership roles and positions? I mean, obviously, I think at that level within a command, there's a lot of decentralized uh, leadership that yeah. could absolutely square you away yeah. and make it easier. But it seems like that wasn't the case. 
I think it would vary, right? Not every experience is going to be like mine. But I also was not someone who would advocate for myself because if in my eyes, Japanese, going back to that, if yeah. I advocate for myself, then I'm a pain in the rear. Mm -hmm. I am making too much noise. I'm being chaotic. So in my eyes, I was just like, whatever you need me to do, I'll just do it. And I, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's really sad to look back on, right? Because especially like the day after chemo, I, I was faint, like fainting. And they made you come in for a year now? For a UA yeah. that was company wide. Wow. At 5 a.m., yeah. And I lived at this point 53 miles from base because I was, I, we moved closer to be, um, closer to the cancer center. Of course. Mm -hmm. So I imagine this process is unique in the military experience. Not many young active duty personnel get cancer like this mm -hmm. and then have to go through this experience. And I imagine the chains of command to maybe their at least justification in not doing the right thing does not know what right looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and then as this process unwinds, it leads to a discharge. Are we discharged before the cancer two round? Or do, did you pick no. up that? Yes. Okay. So you're not technically allowed to be discharged or retired from the military until you're 100% cleared of any, I guess, cleared to their standards of sickness. So I immediately, after finishing my 14 months of chemo, found out that I had ocular cancer. And my ocular cancer was incredibly painful and, and it was very obvious I lost sight in my eye. I was not even able to keep my eye open. Um, and it was super fast moving. And so then I had to be treated for that secondary cancer. Um, I went under went a surgery. Um, so I, a portion of my eye was removed and to take the tumor out of your uh, ocular mm -hmm. nerve mm -hmm. and then treated with chemotherapy eye injections. How does that happen? Like, what is the, <laughs> have you, have you done some research and studying? Like, yeah. how does this map yes. in your body, especially is it genetic or hereditary? Yes. Like what's going on here? So there's a lot of links between fight or flight mode and cancer specifically, and not, your body not being able to recover from things like sickness or fight off cancer cells that maybe other people who have who are less in fight or flight, everyone's in fight or flight at some point in their lives, but um, not, not able to fight off these cells that you are able to. And then undergoing cancer treatment is incredibly detrimental to your immune system and your, and your body. So my hypothesis, this makes this really clear, this is not fact, is that my trial chemo gave me my secondary cancer. And when I reported it to my doctor, he did not put it in my file. He also did not put, I have, there's videos on my IG. Um, I have what's called lichen planus, which is incredibly erosive. So I had all these huge giant open wounds covering my body from head to toe. And from, from what, what is that? From my chemo. Oh my God. Cause your skin, the skin would just open up. Yeah. I mean, just huge. And I have like, I have scars, but all, I mean, all these were open. It, they just randomly would open because of the treatment of chemo. It all happened once, one huge. So your skin's your largest organ. So anything yeah. that's going wrong in the inside is going to try and get out. So it's purging it like purging. it's purging. It's like, this is too toxic. Get this out of my body. Wow. And so that autoimmune stuff happened right around the same time as my eye cancer. And so I had, I think in my hypothesis, once again, is that I had high toxicity from my chemo going through it for that long created an autoimmune response and then created a secondary cancer. And then I was treated for that with additional chemotherapy. And I think being in that experience has opened my eyes a lot to Western medicine and how we're so reactive to things and maybe don't necessarily give our patients the most amount of data before telling them that they should be doing something and um, giving them the opportunity to critically think and think if that's something that they actually want to do. And mm. and it's also, there's no holistic approach to it. It's very binary. Very binary. And they're, you know, they're treating the symptoms and then attacking it. And there's not, because I think about, you know, like the fight or flight thing, it's your cortisol, cortisol levels are elevated, suppressing your immune system mm -hmm. and, and maybe communicating about your levels of stress and where you're at in your life and how things are going at work would benefit you holistically versus totally. let's just attack this one issue. That's totally. a compounded issue, obviously. Yeah. When, oh. I, when I asked my oncologist also if there was anything that I could do outside of chemotherapy that would help me, even I was, I had already agreed to do chemo. Is there anything else I could do? Like take a vitamin, do some sort of exercises, breathing? It was no. 
it was just N O. Of course. Not drinking more water, not exercise, not taking vitamin D, not take not nothing. No recommendations. Zero. Yeah. But that's what you're here for now. That's what your yeah. new, new goal is. Hey guys, this podcast is brought to you by the US Concealed Carry Association. You know we're big fans of survival and survival always depends on one question. How prepared are you? Just like we work to be prepared to survive any situation, the USCCA trains you to be prepared and feel confident as a gun hunter, especially if you ever need to use it in self-defense. I've been a member for over three years because not only do I get access to their online protector academy, where I can learn from experts on critical aspects of survival, such as how to shoot accurately under pressure and how to prepare for family and home defense planning, but I also get self-defense liability insurance in case I'm ever involved in a dangerous incident. There's a reason 800,000 American gun owners like myself trust them. So check them out at uscca.com forward slash FCS to claim your risk-free benefits right now, as well as a free gift when you sign up. That's uscca.com forward slash FCS. Thanks, guys. Well, okay, so you get through this second round of cancer, and then we get to a point where you're getting medically discharged. Mm -hmm. How does that process go? Like, what is that? How do they determine you're clear? Because it seems like you you, you wouldn't be in remission mm -hmm. f in, it, for the extension of the five years, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't be clear. So, how does that work? I don't the <laughs> the transition process is super strange for the military. I don't even I can't even comp comprehend how it is how the way uh, the way that it is, but mm -hmm. um. They, yeah, they deemed me because I I was told also that I was I would never be able to walk with comfort again. I would never be able to run again. I would never be able to hike again because of the trauma that had been done to my foot and my ankle. And I had experienced. I definitely understood where they were coming from because I had extreme ner uh, nerve damage, extreme like ligament, bone, etc. Damage done by surgery. I understand where they were coming from, but then to go from that to saying you're good to go <laughs> yeah is uh, <laughs> back to work yeah and just, yeah the transition process is super interesting but yeah they did they actually i'm actually medically retired mm. um so they medically retired me and on your merry way i don't even know it's a blink of an eye it was the weirdest experience of my life because i my whole identity had been tied to being in the military i i was planning to go uh sergeant major that was that first group wanted me to go to ranger school and I, I had all these plans and it all came to a screeching halt and i no longer knew who i was truthfully mm. um being and you're transitioning from having cancer there's a yeah. whole bunch of issues here totally yeah what what year is this 2000 this is last year 100 percent last year yeah Oh, sorry. No, we're in 2024 now. It's, gen it's yeah, January. Yeah, it's yeah. a year and yeah. some shit, a couple of months. But yeah. you're you're in the middle of a transition right now. Yeah. I mean, technically. Totally. Um, how is that going for you? It's better now than it ever has been. Really? Yeah. Okay. However, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> it's, it's different, I imagine. Yeah. It's interesting. I think it... Uh, the military has its way of teaching its own language, mm. right? We, we we only speak our own language. No one knows what we're saying when we say certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think, the like we were talking about of my transition from JSOC to first group, the, the love that I have for service and being able to have an impact was something that I was craving. So after I left the military, there was a small stint of time in which I worked in the operating room. So I worked in spine and neurosurgery because I thought, okay, what can I do that's gonna give me the same level of feeling like I'm making an impact? And then I realized that, I, um, that the medical system is just a little bit screwed up, mm -hmm. um, even in the civilian world and a, a little bit unethical is an understatement. Yeah. Um, so I quit my job in, in September to pursue my mission a hundred percent and to say no plan B, this is what I want to do. I want to commit my life to making a difference because truthfully, I don't think that I would have been served the platter that I was if it wasn't for a reason. I believe in God and whether you do or not, we're directed by so many things in our life. We have, we have the option to be taken away by the current of, of media, of, you know, the people around you, what they're doing, their habits, or you go in the direction of your values. And I've chosen 
to 100% commit to going in the direction of of what I value and what I think would actually allow me to make a difference in, in this world and leave the world a better place if I were to die tomorrow. So that's the new mission statement. Yes, yep. Yeah, and you seem um, invigorated by that. Yes. And you're Asian, so I know you'll do it Do you know right. Ikigai? Yes. Ah, yeah. uh, yes, yeah. yes. I, I did a whole deep dive on Ikigai. And for those listening, Ikigai is a Japanese principle to explain this interconnection between purpose, passion, what you're really good at, what you can be paid for, and what the world needs from you. Mm. And it's such a beautiful word to describe such a beautiful concept. And um, I've really really committed my life to to actually living in line with my ikigai. Mm. I, I notice part of that is bringing awareness to kind of what's going on in the medical field and uh, and cancer. But I, I also see a segment of you inspiring people to do things like um, mentally and physically challenging themselves, mm -hmm. building it, this, it, this adversity, this mindset, this resilience through challenging yourself, whether it's cold plunge or in this case, you're running a hundred mile race, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Like, where does that come from and how has that helped you? I imagine it's helped you uh, in a physical way to also overcome some of the obstacles because it's improving your mental health as well. Yeah, I mean, I think once again, going back to this idea that, that we all can be victors or victims are, of our experience. And I have a gentle way of, of saying, these are the hard things that I do with the, the challenges that I've faced. But we could do a non-gentle approach by saying that everyone chooses whether or not they want to be a victim of their experience or they don't want to be a victim of their experience. Mm -hmm. And for me, being told that I would never run or hike again was a challenge. I view mm -hmm. that as a challenge. And I think maybe it comes from my military background or my Japanese background, but having a warrior mindset with all of the things that come in your path is super important. Mm -hmm. And realizing that everything that's come into your path is an opportunity, not a setback. It is an opportunity for you to learn, for you to persevere through that challenge and to take away lessons that you would never have learned otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's so important for me to make sure that other people are aware of because it's almost celebrated to feel like a victim. Hmm. And I can tell you wholeheartedly that I very, very easily could have fallen victim to my experience of having cancer and having a secondary cancer and having an autoimmune disease. And, but I never once thought for a second that I, that I am a victim of my experience. Hmm. And I, that's, that has changed my life. That is what saved me from cancer. And that is, that is what I've taken as why I, will always beat cancer whether or not I die from it. It's truly inspiring. I mean, a lot of people go through challenges and, um, but it's almost like you're, it's almost like you haven't been through this massive experience and then this is a post assessment of that and reflection. Mm -hmm. You're currently dealing with all of these things in real time. Yeah. I mean, you, you're not even outside the recession, recession window of this and you're still managing it, mm -hmm. which is uh, very inspirational. You. Um, you're running a hundred mile race. Talk to us about the yeah. specifics of that race and then why you're running the race. Yes. So I am running Leadville 100 in Leadville, Colorado in August. And last, this past year I, I raced Ironman. So I never even swam before, um, <laughs> in, in the army, you don't have to be able to swim. You <laughs> so, don't have to do it. Yeah. Um, Jump out of an airplane. That's all. Yeah. yeah. That was my motivator for doing Ironmans. I had told a friend, uh, I can never do Ironman. And at the time I'd, I'd been through cancer and done all these crazy things. So I, I committed my 2022 or no, wait, 2023 to, to Ironmans. And now I'm committing my 2024 to 100, 100 mile um, and other ultra marathons because I want to show people how capable they are. And I feel very called to inspire, uplift and illuminate how capable we all are. And I think it's very easy, like I said, to fall victim to your experiences, but to fall into this comfort of, I'll just do these small little goals that I feel comfortable with that might look good to everyone else and I'm okay with. Like my half marathons, my my trail races, whatever. But I wanted to do something that actually scares the living heck out of me. Mm. And that's running 100 miles. In the mountains. In the mountains, uh, starting elevation at 10 and a half thousand. So it's all above you know, well above sea level. Um, if you've ever been at 10 and a half thousand, that in itself is, is high elevation. 
but I'm, I'm committing my life to this this year in support of First Ascents. So First Ascents is a charity organization that provides outdoor experiences to cancer patients and survivors. So they they put on these giant retreats where they they take cancer survivors or patients rock climbing or uh, even like white river rafting and mm. these awesome experiences. And I found them through Led, looking at Leadville um, as my next goal. And it was just so perfectly aligned. And I think specifically for my journey, there's there's no better choice for me to do something extremely difficult that scares the living heck out of me than to do something in line with a cancer organization. That's amazing. And, and how does that work? Do you do the run and then people just track you and support you and then they could donate? to that or how does that work? No, so races have a minimum fundraising. So in order to race, you have to fundraise for the organization. Mm. So Leadville is actually, you have to qualify for Leadville. You have mm -hmm. to go in or go through a lottery system of being selected, or you can race for charity, which I always encourage everyone to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you have to hit a certain amount before the race itself. Mm. Um, and thankfully, I, I'm going to be documenting, there's, there's gonna be a long form documentary on my Leadville experience. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna be so lovely for people to watch at the end, but my goal up until then is to raise my minimum at the very least um, amount before Leadville. What's your minimum? Uh, 3,500. 3,500? Yeah. How much uh, have you raised so far? I've raised 550, it just started uh, last week. Really? Yeah. Well, Phil Craft will pay the rest of that raise no, right what? now. No, we'll do that. Stop it! You said you th you said thirty five hundred, not thirty five grand, right? No. we'll do it. We're gonna Are do it. Are you serious? Yeah. We've already. We, you're inspiring. We oh, it, put a Phil Craft logo in your back. Oh, you're gonna Get make it. me tear up. <laughs> I will. No, we'll do it. We'll, Are you we'll I'll write your check today. Stop it! No, that's awesome. I'm, I'm I really inspired. appreciate that. that. Yeah, you're welcome. That means so much to me. Yeah, we'll make it easy, but we still have to raise more. That's just yeah, the, that's just the beginning, of I imagine, right? Yeah. It and is. what's the date that you have to raise by? Uh, sometime in July. Oh, we got plenty of time to raise yeah. more. But yeah, we'll cover the cost. Oh, I so appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. It means a lot to me. That's gonna be awesome. I, I'm I'm actually really excited about following this endeavor and seeing you get back to it. I think it's uh, very impactful, all of the things that you've been through and you're able to just pick yourself up every day and just do this. Like I, I saw some of your videos, including the ones where you're just doing the cold plunge and you're talking about this adversity that you have to manage every day. And I think it, I don't know what it is. It's very different because a lot of people do it, but organically, because you've been through it, it just hits a little different. It just impacts different and don't, don't stop. I yeah, mean, people thanks. need that with all the toxic stuff that's online, Totally. all the horrible people that are just going through a lot of stuff. Yeah. People need more uplifting content. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, I appreciate you so much. That uh, just made my day. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. It's, that's an easy, it's an easy thing for us to do. And we always want to support great people who are doing amazing things, especially in the name of, uh, philanthropic endeavors, helping other people. Totally. That's what it's all about. So um, we'll line that out. And then how can people follow your journey and all the things that you're doing? Yes. Yeah, so everything is just Miss Amanda, which is the corniest name ever. I'm, I'm totally aware, but I'm not going to change it. It's too, too long gone. So yeah, it's perfect. just Miss Amanda um, on, on IG, um, YouTube, and TikTok if you have it. <laughs> so all three of the platforms you're on. And yes. then you're doing the documentary. Where's the documentary going to go? So it'll be posted on my own page and then also on Bear Performance Nutrition. Do mm -hmm. you know this company? No. What is it called? Bear Bear Performance. Started by Nick Bear. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, it'll be on really their awesome. page as well. Awesome. And then um you who's filming the documentary? The BPN team. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be awesome. Yeah. I'm yeah, so excited. super excited about that. Guys, I'll put all the links down below and make sure that you have uh, access to that. And then do you have a donation link too? I this? do, yes, yes. Okay. We'll include that in the donation link as well. Uh, Amanda, I want to say thank you for coming out. Thank you. It was thanks a great so conversation. Yeah, it was so awesome. easy. <laughs> it was awesome. It was super easy. All right, thanks, guys.